Hello guys, welcome back to Bizarre Podcast. Today I've got another Halloween special for you. I'm going to be talking about a TV program that aired in the UK in 1992 on Halloween night and absolutely terrified the nation. So let's jump right into it. Oh and guys, if you want to stick around at the end of the episode, I've got a bit of news about the future of Bizarre Podcast and where I want to take it. If it sounds like something you want to listen to, just stick around at the end. Enjoy. So welcome live this Halloween night to the first ever TV Ghost Watch. That's the scene in uh, Fox Hill Drive in North Oaks. Our outside broadcast units are there. That's the house where it might all happen tonight or it might not. We shall see. We're going to investigate one of the most baffling and fascinating areas of human experience, the supernatural. Tonight, television is going ghost hunting in an unprecedented scientific experiment. We hope to show you for the first time irrefutable proof that ghosts really do exist. Halloween night, 1992. I'm nine years old. And that night, I remember well for one reason and one reason only. And that was because of a TV show. You see, I was spending the weekend with my grandparents. And the time was creeping up to 9.25pm. I was allowed to stay up late at my grandparents. I got away with murder. My grandfather flicked the channel to the BBC One. And there was a TV show about to begin. A Halloween special named Ghost Watch. I've been looking forward to it all day. Even at nine years old, I had a fascination with anything unexplained. You see, the premise of this show was as follows. There was going to be a live ghost investigation at a UK home, a family home, that reminded me a lot of the Enfield Poltergeist House. A group of top BBC talent were presenting this live investigation. Sarah Green and Craig Charles were at the scene of the house looking for evidence of ghosts, whilst the great Michael Parkinson stayed in the BBC studios taking calls and talking to paranormal experts. Now, to anyone not in the UK, you've probably never heard of Michael Parkinson, but trust me, over here, he is a TV treasure, and he's been on the TV since before I was born. So he's a very well-respected member of the BBC. Now, let me just remind you once again... I have only seen this once, way back in 1992 when I was nine years old, and I've never seen it again. You see, it was never broadcast again, and it made such an impact on me that I never forgot it. And I think that goes for most people in the UK as well who would have seen it on that night. So, for the next hour and a half, I sat cross-legged on the floor in front of the TV, totally entertained. I loved every minute of it. The investigation started out slow, with no real activity happening. The whole seemed quite calm, making jokes and interviewing members of the family. But slowly, activity started to happen. Bangs here and there, furniture being moved by unseen forces, scratches appearing on the children's skin, and also ghostly voices coming from the children. We would also see ghostly figures lurking in the shadows, but once the cameras went back to check, there was no one there. It was a case of blink and you'll miss it. Eventually, as the show went on, back in the studio, Michael Parkinson and crew members were getting call after call from people at home watching the show, claiming that they were being tormented by ghosts. As I sat there for that hour and a half, as the rest of the nation did, the activity in the show went from one extreme to the other. It escalated. At one point, the activity in the house got so bad that Sarah Green was dragged by unseen forces into an under-the-stairs cupboard and the door abruptly shut and she could be heard screaming inside. As the actual live studio started to get attacked by unseen forces, an unnatural wind blew through the studio, cameras moving on their own accord, and then darkness. Everyone ran from the studio. It wasn't long before the studio was completely empty, apart from Michael Parkinson, who still wanted to carry out his broadcast. So as the security lights came back on, and it was like a dim lighting in the studio, you could see... Michael Parkinson walking around looking bewildered and trying to find the right camera to stir in. And then, all of a sudden, you could hear like these demonic voices, like Parkinson was being uh, possessed by some of the ghosts. And then, just like that, the live feed went dead. And that was it. It just ended. The whole of the UK was in shock. Had Sarah Green just been pulled into a cupboard by a ghost and killed? Had Michael Parkinson, the beloved treasure of UK TV, been possessed by a ghost? What the heck had just happened on this live paranormal investigation presented by respectable BBC presenters? And was it possible that this could be the definitive proof 
that ghosts exist? Well, no. It turned out that this whole show was in fact a hoax. It was actually an hour and a half mockumentary that wasn't live at all, and it had been recorded previously and acted out perfectly. So perfectly that it fooled most of the nation. The BBC was flooded with phone calls. You see, people actually thought that the show was real and that they were having paranormal activities in their own home because of this show. Half the UK was terrified, the other half was furious. Let me just tell you a bit about this programme. Written by Sim Volk and directed by Leslie Manning, Ghostwatch was a UK mockumentary that was intended as just a bit of fun. During the broadcast on UK TV in 1992, it received over 30,000 calls to the BBC switchboard in a single hour. The complaints were so bad that the BBC never actually aired this show ever again. I believe it did make its rounds on certain streaming services and you can probably still find it on some of them right now. I think it might be Shudder you can find this programme on. Um, It also made the rounds on some Canadian TV channels and Belgium TV channels. And you can also pick it up on DVD. I think it was released in 2002. Now, as I said before, this TV show was planned perfectly. It was made to look like a live broadcast. People were encouraged to ring into the studio with their own ghost stories. You see, this will play a big part later when viewers claim to see ghosts in their own house. And of course, these calls were all part of the show. So anyone who did actually pick up the phone and ring in, they would get a recorded message informing them that Ghostwatch was in fact a drama and it was fake. So you see on the actual programme, when they had these fake phone calls ringing to the studio claiming that they had seen or heard something in their house, planted the seed in the actual viewer's head of the possibilities of actual paranormal activity acting out in their own home. In my opinion, it simply made the UK's imagination just run riot. And then you've got the part in the studio where Michael Parkinson is joined by paranormal experts who try and explain the activity. This all makes the whole thing seem more credible. See, at first, the evidence of ghosts was minuscule. A few bumps here, a few bangs there. The presenters making jokes and messing about a bit all made it feel like a normal TV show. And eventually, they would build up the story slowly. They would have interviews with so-called neighbours and family who lived there and started to build this backstory of the haunting. We learn that the house is always making noises, mostly coming from the pipes. So the family named the ghost Pipes. I like to call him Mr. Pipes. And this I actually thought was quite a very clever element to this mockumentary. You see, as a kid, I was always hearing sounds in the house. Bangs here, bumps here. And it scared me. And when my mother came to comfort me, the one thing she always told me is, it's just the pipes in the house. It's the central eating making the house make noises. This always seemed to be the excuse. And I think it was probably the reason why you got all these bumps and bangs in most houses in the UK of the central eating so you can imagine on that cold night how many houses would have had the central eating on that night and how many houses would have been making the normal bumps and bangs that always seem to be due to the central eating so as people's imaginations are probably running wild at home hearing noises in the house tricking themselves into thinking that they're hearing some kind of ghost back at the studio they're receiving these fake calls from people in the uk claiming that they've heard something in the house which is putting more paranoia into the people of the UK watching the actual broadcast. And then the programme all of a sudden claims that they have a backstory on the ghost Mr Pipes. Eventually we find out that the ghost of Pipes is the spirit of a psychologically disturbed man named Raymond Tunstall, who lived in the house with his aunt and uncle. Raymond believed he was haunted by the ghost of Mother Seddons, a baby farmer turned child killer from the 19th century. Another bit of the backstory tells us that Mr. Pipes was a child molester and will appear wearing a black dress, like the ghost of Mrs. Seddon. His face is mauled and horrific to look at, and his eyes are missing, and this is due to his cats feasting on his remains when he died in the house. Now you've got to admit, that is a cool, creepy, scurry backstory for any Halloween programme. Another thing that happened in the documentary is quite interesting, uh, because it mirrors another poltergeist case, an actual poltergeist case, the Enfield poltergeist. Um, I'll explain now, but you see, one of the girls in the documentary is caught banging the pipes, essentially faking the ghostly noises. So then it goes back to the studio, and back in the studio, Michael Parkinson claims that it must all be a hoax. Um, 
This actually mirrors what happened to the children in the Enfield Poltergeist case. You see, on that case, I think it was Janet Hodgson was caught faking some things, but later claimed it was faked in desperation to get the media to believe them. You see, the media were there and all activity just stopped. So I think Janet was making these noises up to kind of persuade them that things were happening. They just weren't happening at this moment. Um, and that's what happened in the show. And it seemed that it was inspired by the Enfield Poltergeist. It seemed to have a lot of similarities. And I believe they did this on purpose just to give everyone at home a little bit of rest from the scurs and put the doubt in the mind that this may all just be fake before throwing them back in at the deep end. Because you see the activity was about to pick up again in the house. You see, it isn't long before actual sightings begin to happen in the house. People at home start to see Mr Pipes. I believe there's actually a scene where the camera pans across the bedroom and you see the figure of a black shadow man stood in the curtains. And then, of course, one of the fake phone calls came in, claiming that they had seen the ghost stood at the window. So, of course, they played the video back, but of course it weren't the same video because it was all recorded previously. They simply recorded it with the actor stood in the, wi in the window and then they've gone back and recorded it again with the actor not there. So this was putting doubt into people's minds in the UK of whether they saw it or not. Like I said before, it's a case of blink and you miss it. And back in those days, you couldn't re rewind the TV, you couldn't pause TV. There was no way to see it afterwards on the internet. There was no way to check your phone and check whether this was actually real or not. People just saw what they saw and then that was it. There was no way to repeat it. And now at this point, more and more phone calls start to come into the studio saying that they have seen ghosts and heard ghosts and experienced paranormal activity in their own homes around the UK. And then when the broadcast goes back to the house, we find out that one of the crew members have been injured when a mirror falls on top of him. We start to see objects being thrown around the house by unseen forces. And it is suggested by the paranormal expert that the show has been acting as some kind of big seance and it has now spread out throughout the UK through everyone's television set and no one is safe. Back in the house it gets crazy as the presenter Sarah Green is dragged off by a ghost and pulled into a cupboard underneath the stairs where you can hear her screaming and that's it, you don't find out what happened to her after that. As everyone runs clear of the house, we see the police arriving, lots of police cars and flashing sirens coming down the street. And then the broadcast goes back to the BBC studio, where it would seem that the poltergeist, Mr Pipes, has took control of the network. So as we go back to the studio, we see that the cameras are moving around the studio by unseen forces. We see that lights are exploding all over the studio, and then all of a sudden the studio is just plunged into darkness and you can hear every single crew member run out of the studio and then like I said before the only person left in the studio is Michael Parkinson stumbling around in the dimly lit studio unsure of which camera to look at or even if the broadcast is still happening and then he starts to read the teleprompter and he reads out round around the garden like a teddy bear and as he's reading this his voice starts to change and it changes into the voice of Mr. Pipes, the poltergeist. And he asks if us, the viewers, believe the story of Mother Seddon's. And his final words are fee fi fum And the programme cuts off abruptly and ends. Now, it may seem a little silly. Maybe the UK was gullible, but it really did fool a lot of people. Or at least make them doubt their own minds. You see, I believe that back in 1992, I think people were more... I don't want to say gullible, but I think they were easier to fool. I think if this mockumentary happened today, I don't think it would be believed one little bit. I think the fact that it was made back in 92 um, probably explains why it was believed more than it would be believed today. We didn't have the internet back then. We didn't have this wealth of knowledge that we have at our fingertips back then. Maybe we were a little bit more gullible in those days. You see, now these days you can just turn on Netflix and you can find any amount of fan footage films or mockumentaries it, they, they're not a rare thing anymore this program probably spawned a lot of these mockumentary films that are out there such as the Blur Witch Project and things like that but back in 92 we simply didn't have any of that and we just took it as we saw it now let's just delve back into the making of the program uh, the house scenes were shot a few weeks 